I remember once I was in a church giving a talk and I went into some of this stuff and started talking about goals and this and that and how we've all learned all these um, all these beliefs and then we have all these specific goals. It's good to be goal oriented, I was always taught, you know. And how when I finally got to the course I was saying that's a bunch of baloney to be goal oriented because all those goals were specific goals and all those goals were based on the self-concept that's where the goals were springing from it's kind of like if you think of a, an aquarium and a little pump at the bottom with the, that blows the bubbles pumps the air into it that the bubbles seem to, to to come up and to float up to the top and to pop on the surface. And that's like all these specific goals that I had in my life all the time. More, make more money, get this, get that, develop these skills, you know, do this, do that. I mean, those are pop, 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 that's all the bubbles. But what about the little thing that's where the bubbles are coming, what's generating the bubbles? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's finally the point, I came to my point in my life where it's like, I'm going to get down there to that generator, and I'm going to question that, that little mechanism that seems to, the bubbles seem to be coming from. So all specifics come from the self-concept. Yes. If you want to, if lessons 24 and 25 in the course just address this very, very directly. And... To me, it's kind of like, when I was talking about this and sharing this with this fellow at this church, he, he started to get a little bit angry, because he was saying, like, that can't be, it can't be what the Course is, is advocating. I said, he's saying, does that mean we shouldn't have any goals? I said, no, no, the Course is not advocating that you shouldn't have any goals. The Course is advocating that you should have one goal. <laughs> and only one. And only one goal. And that that goal is abstract, that that goal is universal, that goal does not have a specific reference. What? What does that mean? It's not quantifiable. <laughs> it's not quantifiable, it's not measurable, you, it's, a, it's a goal of purpose. It's not a, a specific goal, it's not X amount of dollars or a better job or better physical health or um, a warmer climate or a better looking mate or all the specific goals that, that are popping up here on the surface, you know. It, this goal that's a universal goal has to be learned very carefully because the mind that thinks in terms of specifics, that's all it can think in terms of. That's what it prays for all the time. Its prayer is its desire and it's always praying for specific outcomes. It, when you think, even you have the thought, gee, I'm hungry, and then something pops to mind that seems to, that would, would seem to satisfy that hunger. When you seem to have to go to the restroom, or you have a, a need to, you perceive a need to urinate, and, you, and it pops into mind where the restroom is in the house or the building that you're in. And you seem to go and urinate and it seems to satisfy that momentary, temporary need. Those are all pr answers to prayers. Going to the bathroom is an answer to prayer. Having a, a Dorito chip is an answer to prayer. You know, having sexual intercourse with someone is an answer to prayer. Going for a walk on a sunny day is an answer to prayer. Everything on the screen is an answer to prayer. It's just it's just bringing witness to what the mind wants and also what the mind believes will answer that want or will satisfy that want. That's all that what the surface is. So the key thing is, is, gee, I have all these splintered desires and that's part of that self-concept that's bubbling away, bubbling away down there, sending all these bubbles up. The only way out is for me to have a single unified goal, or to bring, bring it to the point that my desire is single, and that I want only God. I don't want anything else. If you think of the, the, 
center of the mind being like an altar is just saying, I, I want to remove everything but the altar except God. God can't be on a defiled altar. He can't be on something that's made unclean. Something that's so pure, we talk about the source. Something that's so pure as the source, you can't put something as pure as the source on a, on a dirty altar or a, a split altar. You won't share the altar? All the spirit will do will wait. The spirit will not try to come in and try to take over the mind again. The mind has to willingly empty its altar. You know, the Holy Spirit is not going to try to wrestle this world away from the mind. The Holy Spirit, in one sense, you know, even though the beliefs are unreal, he respects or he honors them in one sense because the Son of God, or the, the mind that fell asleep, made them. And he's, he has to honor that mind because of what that mind truly is. He honors the source of it. Yeah, he honors the source of it, and he honors the true power of that mind. But he's just working, you know, it's like a gentle reminder for the mind to voluntarily bring those beliefs, you know, to the light or to open them to question. There's no coercion involved. There's no, you know, forcing. I mean, the more I started to follow this, the more I would have, I would have some moments of fear where I would just, again, it would be that ego belief system in my mind saying, you know, if you follow this all the way out, if you really follow what he's saying, you know, you could, the ego is saying, you could end up in dire straits because you're withdrawing all of your seeming support in the world. Your, what was before regarded as support system, you're, you're cutting your support system. That's the, that's the ego's interpretation of, of following Jesus, is cutting your support Pulling system. Plug. Yeah. <laughs> burning all your bridges. All that learning you know, we talked about resumes, learning, and all the different things that seem to be like just such symbols of support that you've worked so hard on to to build. Build it, polish it, build it, polish it, build it, polish it, as if that's your support. And then you, you really start to follow this and you say, well, wait a minute here. This is a direction that's completely the opposite of all that. 180 degree turnaround from that. That's where the trust comes in. I mean, you know, where you thought something was asked of you, where you thought you were asked to sacrifice something, you know, at one point in the manual, Jesus says, the teacher of God finds a, a happy lightheartedness instead. The world can teach no images of you unless you want to learn them. There will come a time when images have all gone by, and you will see you know not what you are. It is to this unsealed and open mind that truth returns, unhindered and unbound. Where concepts of the self have been laid by is truth revealed exactly as it is. When every concept has been raised to doubt and question, and been recognized as made on no assumptions that would and the light, then is the truth left free to enter its sanctuary, clean and free of guilt. There is no statement that the world is more afraid to hear than this. I do not know the thing I am, and therefore do not know what I am doing, where I am, or how to look upon the world or on myself. Yet in this learning is salvation born, and what you are will tell you of itself. In one sense, that's what symbolically the messengers of peace are. We probably won't put this on our pamphlet, but it's, in one sense, that, that's just a witness or a symbol of, of giving your mind permission to let go of everything that it believes and knowing that it's going to be safe that it may seem disorienting at times, you know, both 
Beverly and Rhonda has been sharing over the last number of months that there have been these moments of not knowing. Feeling out of time and space. Yeah. What am I doing? Where am I? You know, no sense of orientation. You know, and what we what we're doing is we're like kind of metaphorically holding hands and saying, yeah, that's the way it's going to seem at times, and that we will keep gently reminding each other. You know, good, good. <laughs> You're not nuts. <laughs> You don't need to be locked up in a in an insane asylum. This is a good sign, <laughs> you know. That when it's you know even at times it can seem like uh, the deeper you go, the more it, at moments it seems almost like you're non-functional. You cannot function in the world. Good. <laughs> Another good sign, you know, that's... The first that I felt when that happened to me, because I've had that experience at other times in my life where you just, momentarily you feel like, you know, you have this sense of, like, where am I, or, like, even waking up in a, quote, a strange place, you know, like, for an instant, you, it's like, you forget where you are, or what, what you're doing there, or something, and there's a panic. I mean, in the past, it's always been associated with a panic feeling to me, even if it was minor or momentary. And that as soon as as soon as I seemed to reorient myself, it was like, oh, the panic subsided. It's like, oh, okay, I remember what I'm doing here and where I am and stuff. At this time, when it happened, when I felt that sense of I, one of them, I think, was in the car. I forget where the other one was, maybe they were both in the car, and I was driving, and I just had this feeling of, like, I had a clue what state, where I was in, what road I was on, what I was doing there, where I was going, anything, but it didn't feel panicky. I mean, that was the distinction that I made in my mind, it was like, wow, that was interesting, you know, to have that feeling and not feel like panicky and feel a relief when it seemed to, when the memory seemed to come back, oh yeah, I'm driving in such and such a room. So that was neat for me, I mean, that was, that was, it, it did feel like, oh good, this is good. <laughs> Nothing to panic about. <laughs> Strange is not necessarily scary or bad. Yeah.